Dr. Anoop Miripuri Mirpuri is an assistant professor of English and an, uh, an affiliate faculty member in Black Studies at Portland State University. His research focuses on the relationship between American capitalism and representations of crime and prison in American culture. His work shows us the role that the humanities can play in public conversations about race, policing, gun violence, and social justice that are taking place in Portland and obviously all over the country. He's beginning, beginning tonight with the provocative question, why do we have police? Please welcome Dr. Anoop Mirpuri. Okay, Dirty Harry, I should say. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make a guess that almost every person in this room assumes that the police are a necessary part of our society. And if this is true, I think it's because instead of asking why we have police, we're constantly encouraged to be afraid of what life would look like without the police. So these are, I'm just gonna show a few images of the 1971 film Dirty Harry. After vanquishing the criminal, Detective Harry Callahan dramatically tosses his badge in the water because he's fed up with how things like rights and due process get in the way of policing. So now the badge toss is one of the most cliché gestures in the history of American cinema. What does it say? It says, think about what life would look like without the police. Anarchy. Murderers and rapists on the loose. The badge toss speaks in the voice of law and order, which pervades our entire culture. Right? News media, literature, television, film. It's the voice that encourages us to imagine dangerous people lurking in dark alleys the one that makes us roll up our windows when driving through unfamiliar neighborhoods. So let's stop being afraid and ask the question, why do we have police? In the early 1800s, there were three fears that led to the establishment of the first police forces. Fugitive slaves, the threat of slave rebellions, and Indians fighting against the theft of their land. So we defined as criminal the very people whose bodies and land we were stealing, and it was their struggle for freedom that scared us into establishing the first police forces. This is crazy, right? We have to think about this. It means that throughout most of American history, to struggle for freedom is to be in the constant state of resisting arrest. So today, thanks to those criminals, the police have to at least say that they serve and protect everyone, rather than the interests of the powerful. But last week, when the Portland police attacked protesters with pepper spray, at City Hall, they were speaking in the voice of law and order. They were saying that the people have no right to determine how the police do their job, that the police should be insulated from democratic accountability. If after all this time, the police is just as resistant to democracy as it has always been, then what, func what function do the police actually serve? What if we adopt the perspective of the police's targets? the so-called criminals. From their standpoint, now as much as ever, the function of the police is to serve and protect the interests of the ruling class. Take Ferguson, Missouri. This is a city where the richest corporation pays no taxes, zero, and so the police have to extract wealth from the city's black working class by arresting them. The police, the judges, the city attorneys effectively pay their own salaries by criminalizing the population they're supposed to be serving and protecting. But this is just one example of a systemic issue. Since the 1970s, unemployment has become a structural feature of our economy, while wealth has been transferred from the working classes and the middle classes to the top 1%. And since that time, the police's primary function has been to deal with the problems of growing economic inequality by criminalizing the poor. And this is precisely the point when America begins the largest prison building project in the history of the entire world. Now, thanks to massive protests against police violence, today policing is in crisis. And this is a good thing because crisis is an opportunity for change. In response, people are suggesting two main reforms, among others, right? Diversify police forces and make the police wear body cameras. The problem is that these reforms are actually less about change and more about resolving the current crisis as simply as possible. 
Because of this, these reforms are far more likely to justify continued police violence than to end it. Now, if you benefit from how society works, from how it's currently organized, then maybe peace and quiet for you is more important than peace and justice for everyone. But if you're really interested in justice, first, you have to listen to the police's targets, the people our society calls criminals and hoodlums and thugs. Second, you have to demand reforms that will make police, police unions want to toss their badges. You have to make them really, really angry. But ultimately, justice isn't really about reforming the police. It's about reforming a society that produces such extreme inequalities that the police are seen as the only way to deal with it. Thank you.